website. KCA Radio, the only true local radio station on your radio dial. Hey, buddy, I hoid the droughts moving in, muscling in on your turf. To make matters worse, the man keeps telling you to limit your spigot. That drought is bad news, no fooling. But me and my boys can help. The water boys, on the water zone, Thursday nights at 6. We'll help you protect your turf and save water. And hey, don't worry about it. Consider it a gift. Yeah, Louie, you heard the boss. We gotta listen in at 6 p.m. on Thursday nights. Okay, Vinny, you got it. The water zone, Thursday nights at 6 p.m. I'll tell our lawn it's now protected. News Radio Broadcasting Studios of KCAA 1050 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM, located in beautiful, sunny, and hot California. Thanks for tuning into the Water Zone today. Good afternoon. I'm Rob Starr, along with Mr. Mike Barron, also known around here as Mikeypedia, and together we are known as Da Water Boys. And Mr. Mike is out in the town called Bishop, and I believe he's calling in with us. Mike, are you there? Mike is not there. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought he was going to be here. Uh, he's probably maybe there's no phone connection out there. It's kind of out in the. Where is Bishop? That's north of here, I guess. I haven't been there. So anyway, good afternoon. I hope everybody's having a great time today. Uh, just some uh, information. If you want to call in and speak with us, the number is 909-792-5222 or 909-792-1050. Uh, we want to announce a, uh, the winner of our contest for July Water Smart, Smart Month. And uh, what the deal was, uh, people to uh, call in or send in. Uh, their names and recommendations of a elementary school and we were doing it in, in our regional area here so uh, Riverside County and San Bernardino County and Orange County and San Diego County and uh, nominate a school so they can win a educational garden and uh, we're very happy to make the announcement the winning school is Mead Valley Elementary School and they're located in Paris California and we're going to notify them tomorrow uh, formally notify them tomorrow so we're very uh, very happy about that and uh, so they're going to get uh, a beautiful educational outdoor living garden uh, and we're going to supply all the product for it and all the equipment get it all installed and some educational material and that's going to be a great thing for the school and uh, so congratulations to Mead Valley Elementary school. Well, again, now it's time to do a little bit of news, and uh, hopefully Chris Austin is on the phone with us. Chris, are you there today? I am, although, boy, you tried. You didn't tell me you had new numbers. <laughs> oh, oh, didn't but Mike... See, give... I'm plucky, and I figured it out. Oh, didn't Mike give you that the last two weeks since I haven't been here? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I got one, and then it was another one, and because everything was in flux, and I didn't no, it had changed. But see, I'm I'm smart. I figured it out. You are very smart. That's why you were the the maven of many things. <laughs> and just, just so our audience knows, we're broadcasting uh, today from our new uh, studios, NBC Broadcasting Studios, and um, actually. This is a temporary room that we're in, and they're building yet another studio around the corner in the building from us. And uh, so hopefully in the next couple of weeks that'll, that'll be built, and it'll, it'll be nice. Uh, it's beautiful here, nice and cool and air-conditioned. And, uh, and Chris, you're going to be down here next week. Is that correct? Yes, I am. Looking forward to that. Yep. Uh, I know you're coming to the uh, San Bernardino Water uh, uh, Conference. This is going to be on the 11th in, in Ontario. And I'm going to be on uh, uh, on a panel. Actually, I'm the moderator of a panel. So uh, maybe you can uh, ask me some tough questions during that, during that event. <laughs> yeah, it'll be my chance. Yeah, it'll be your chance. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Rob. Yeah, I heard you're gunning for me. <laughs> so tell me what's been going on in the water world up in, in, in California. 
Oh, well, let's see. We've had some farmers file claims over the uh, damage from the Oroville crisis, some of the downstream farmers. One one farmer is claiming uh, $15 million of damage. He lost 27 acres of walnut trees, Wow! I guess, plus erosion and flood damage. So it's uh, the expenses go on, shall we say. I mean, he's not the only one claiming damages, just the one that's the, uh, that's the most... <laughs> You know, as, as, so, as Mike and I have always said, the thing that's going to come out of this long five-year drought, more lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's gonna, there's going to be lots of lawsuits about everything coming up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they, they really have to address some of the issues with water rights, uh, you know, and uh, plus the tunnels, plus, yeah, it's, it's pretty good to be a water lawyer, I would say, yeah. So I know I know the state's going to propose some new regulations for legal pot farming, and I wonder what their water restrictions or things are going to be as well. Oh, this is such a hot topic up north, I'll tell you. Um, and, and, boy, we snicker about it, you know. Oh, we're working on pot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, but it, it's actually a very serious issue, and a lot of farmers are thinking about taking this up. and. Uh, like I even read one article a few months ago um, in wine country, it might be turning into cannabis country. They were saying. So, mm. will we see roadside bud stands? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine strawberries? Yeah. Pot, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not seeing this. But, I, 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 just, yeah, I just I just know that I, I just know that the world in this country has changed since I was a young boy. Growing up and, and things that I thought were normal are not normal anymore, and uh, I don't know. I, I, I won't comment on good, bad, or indifferent stuff. I just think it's getting a little crazy. And I know I go out to lunch with some people from work, and we go to these little restaurants, and they have some. It's not a newspaper. It's it's a it's like an info paper. You know, where they have all the ads for the stores and things in it. And 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 I'll tell you that of a, of a ten or twelve page little newspaper. About, about five of them are all about going to a doctor and get, for $25 and getting a certificate that you can go buy marijuana. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean that's all that's in there. It's, it's um, uh, unbelievable. Well, you know, I guess for the benefit of this is that they're, they're going to try and get it out into the open and, and out of the public lands and the forests and stuff because up north they have, they've had some uh, grow operations out there in the wilderness. You know, they're... Uh, not not only are they dumping some pretty potent pesticides and fertilizers around, but they also booby trap them so you know people will leave them alone. And and un, unsuspecting hikers have come into you know contact with some of these things. It, it can be a little dangerous. Yeah, get, so, sh- get shot, you know. get trapped. Yeah, it's it's terrible. Well, so I mean, you know, hopefully we'll draw them out of the, the uh, out of there and we'll get you know. Uh, to it down. I mean, if it's going to happen, let's let's uh, let's let's manage it. So that's that's what they're working on. Uh, so on that. So the state wants to spend more money on on growing pot than and worry about uh, the food crops that they want to shut down and have them move out of state. That's that's strange <laughs> well, I, to me. <laughs> I think you know we really talked about the crops that people were growing in the drought. <laughs> yeah. Almonds and everything. Yep. <laughs> Although you notice that nobody got mad about the grapes. Yeah. It's like they were pissed about the pot and they were mad about the the nuts, but they were fine with the wine. Yeah. Right? Nobody said not <laughs> about the grapes. But wait until the next drought. Yeah. Um, and and won't cannabis be an issue when water gets tight? <laughs> well, but you know it's interesting. You know we've had people on from the almond board and almond growers, and people from wineries and such. And and with the technology that's out there, a um, lot of farming is getting very smart about how to doing it, and they've really done a great job on on uh, on reducing water. And we we had on our ag show, uh, Miss Inky Biscona had mentioned one time that there was a study done. And people, uh, the, the 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 states that gave out, or the state that gave out rebates for reducing, you know, uh, for taking your grass out, uh, and things of that sort. The money they spent, if they put that towards the farming industry, they would have saved a whole lot more water with with the money that they gave for the rebates out. But you know, we don't control that. Hey, I also yeah. Well, and and you know, the thing is, farmers are businessmen, and, and they're smart. Uh, yep. You know, they when water gets 
you know, it, water has been a pricey input for a lot of them, and they've really done their best to uh, minimize their use. A lot of them has, has switched to drip irrigation and micro-irrigation, but, you know, it still, it ought to be said, uh, that not every crop is meant, it should, should be used, you can't use drip on every crop. No. You know, and sometimes it is appropriate to yeah. use sprinklers. Sometimes it's appropriate to use space and flooding. You know, it depends on the crop and it depends on, you know, on the use. Absolutely. Um, and it's just not, it's just not as easy as saying all farmers should go to drip. Yeah. You know, period. That's you true. Know? So there's just a lot of texture to everything. But farmers are, are businessmen and they're smart and, you know, they're doing, they're, they're doing their part. And things are going to get much tighter with the implementation of the Groundwater Management Act. Mm -hmm. So you better believe that the farmers are going to be, you know, really doing what they can do to minimize their water use. Yep. You know, it uh, just makes business sense. Absolutely. Hey, what's this thing I hear about this uh, hexavalent chromium that they want to remove from uh, water standards? Oh, that's the uh, Aaron Brockovich. Uh, chemical, yeah. <laughs> yes, the state in enacted a, 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 dr a standard for drinking water for this chromium six, but it got um, a lot of water agencies saying we can't afford to implement that, uh, to take it down to that level. And so they sued in court, and the court said that the state water board needs to do more economic analysis. So they rescinded it, but they're going back to work on it. They're going to, you know, do their due diligence and try again. So that one's not going to go away. But, you know, it's one of just there's just a lot of things in our drinking water and a lot of substances that, um, you know, we're trying to control. And I think that's only going to increase, which just means, you know, our water costs are going to increase as well. Yeah. And speaking of that, I hear that the twin tw the twin tunnels water project jeopardizes the affordability of water rates well i mean i guess that that really depends on how you look at it and i can certainly understand that if you're low income or you don't have a lot of money uh and you're struggling now that any amount of extra money is um is going to be difficult and i i don't mean to ever minimize that um, but they're talking, you know, Metropolitan is saying that the Twin Tunnels would add five, about $5 a month to every household bill. Hmm. Um, so, you know, the, the opponents of the tunnels are, are really talking about affordability. But, uh, you know, I think it, it, as the way I see it, you know, not trying to minimize those who are low income, the affordability re issue really goes to the farmers. Um, I mean, there are, you know, millions of people down here to split up the cost that will that will incur. The farmers, much less so. And they're looking at some expensive water. They had a meeting at Westland's Water District a few weeks ago where some of those farmers were saying, we don't think we can afford that. Mm. So, you know, it's really the ones to watch on the affordability issue will be the, the agriculture. Can agriculture afford tunnel water? That's the big question. Yeah, I think, you know, with the, with the new gas taxes and things that are coming into play, I mean, things are going to get more and more and more expensive here in California. And, you know, where they're directing the funds to go, I mean, I, I always, you know, as you know me, I, I wish they would run it like a business, which they say they do, but... You know, pick the top three issues that the state has and concentrate on them. And i got to believe water is near th in the top three. And I'd rather see, personally, that go money go to fixing that and getting the infrastructure. I mean, every other day, uh, not literally, but you always hear that a water main broke and, you know, it's a 94-year-old pipe that's split. And, you know, the infrastructure's got to be fixed. I mean, we can't keep going on with over 100-year-old pipes that aren't going to stand up, and it costs so much to do that, yet we're building a train that's not really going anywhere yet, and uh, that's not going to be ready for a long time. But I, I just see, not the, at least for me, my, per, my personal view is the direction is not going where it should go and paying attention. We're paying a lot of money for a lot of different things, and I know we do things in parallel because that's probably what you should do, but, you know, we can't do 
500 different things and we can't do 50 things. I think we should pick the top three or the top five and just concentrate on those until you fix it and then move on to the, you know, that drops off the list and another one comes up to do that. Yeah. I, I think with the infrastructure, you know, what we're, what we're seeing with especially, you know, in uh, Los Angeles is, you know, a lot of those uh, water mains are very, very old. And there's a lot of where, you know, uh, when Los, when the area grew back post World War Two, there's a lot of those, a lot of that infrastructure is still there. And infrastructure projects are kind of, they're not popular. I mean, yes, I I agree, we need to have the government come and help, but I think we also, as ratepayers, need to understand that we have to pay extra rates for you know to get these things fixed and to maintain these systems. Our our water here. Comparatively, and, and I'm here in Santa Clarita. It's it's pretty cheap. I mean, we mm-hmm. our water bills between fifty to seventy five dollars a month. Right. Um, cheapest utility we have up in Reno. This is the interesting thing. Here, you know, Santa Clarita. My water comes from State Water Project, so it gets you know flung over the the hatchbees to land at my tap, right. and my water bill is fifty to you know seventy five dollars a month. Up in Reno, where they get their water from groundwater and from the river that runs through town, um, their water bills are frequently every month you know a hundred, hundred and fifty, and they don't have any power, you know, and they don't have to have that water flung over a mountain to get there. So I think, you know, comparatively, we have not been, at least I, it doesn't seem to me that we've been paying to have that infrastructure uh, maintained. And part of that is, is rate payers, we have to be willing for that. Now, you know, there's all these different ways we can, uh, you know, object to water rates. Um, and, and we've had this Proposition 218 in some some utilities have said, okay, you know, we, we need to do a rate increase, and the, the rate payers say no. And there's one, I think it was on Jones Valley up by Redding. So they said, okay, well, then we can only afford to serve this much water, so you're all now will have to be rationed because there's no other way we can do this. Hmm. Um, <laughs> well, I think so I think we'll see I think, how those residents resolve that, but you know that becomes the reality. Uh, public water agencies are not businesses, and they have you know these different sorts of structures. Right. So I think know. I think you know things that Mike have said and other people until everybody values the true cost of water, you know, like places like Israel and other places that uh, you know people really take the use of water more seriously than we do. Again, everybody here, well, it's not a true statement. I don't, I don't mean to say it that way, but you go, to, you go to your faucet, turn it on, and guess what? Water comes out, and you don't realize what you use and what you pay and, and so forth. So until, until, until people are paying the real true price of water, um, you know, it's, 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 it's changing better, uh, but I don't think it's to the level where it needs to be. And yeah, we haven't even touched paying for habitat restoration no. to, you know, atone for the damage of, you know, withdrawing the water. No, so, that's true. Yeah. Well, one one last good thing. I hear that the University of California Riverside, which is close to here, uh, said they predict that there's going to be more precipitation across the state and may actually increase over the next hundred years. So that would be awesome. Yeah, well, it, it's going to be, it would be different. It would be more rain and less snow. But um, but that is you know that that would be easier to deal with in some instances yeah. than than going drier I would say although you know events like we're having today are what they think you know or how it's going to be and um, I'm not sure how you're doing out there but up here at northern in the northern section you know by Santa Clarita um, in Acton they they had some water rescues. Flash flooding, very serious flash flooding. Wow. Probably some homes flooded and all. So, yeah. very uh, big thunder cells dumping lots of rain. That I think is our going to be part of our climate change future. Yeah, and catching that water is important too. So, anyway, I will see you live next week in the studio, and uh, that'll be fun. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Mikey won't be here with us. <laughs> he's he's not avoiding you. He's just. We're all uh, we're all doing different things. Me. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it up to you. But anyway, to I'm our, take it personally. 
No, I, I know that. Anyway, for our listeners, um, if you haven't checked it out, please do so. It's called mavensnotebook.com. It's great. It gives you the most up-to-date information about water. I mean, we go to her to get the news because she's the lady to go to. She's the go-to person. And um, and if you want to support her on, on that, you can make a donation to keep that thing going. It's a, it's a great outlet and uh everybody in the state reads this thing so it's great so we'll see you we'll see you next week in person and you'll be live here on video and then you can wave to mike and everybody for that so i <laughs> will do that <laughs> great thanks chris See, take care bye-bye bye-bye This is the Schmidt's Yard. Company's coming soon, and, oh, Schmidt, their deck and outdoor furniture's been dominated by dirt. But no worries, there's plenty of time for Scott's Outdoor Cleaner plus OxyClean to work its magic. Its fast-foaming action lifts dirt and wipes out stains from moss, mold, mildew, and algae, guaranteed. All while being safe to use around plants and grass. Because when company's coming... Dirt's not invited. This is a Scott's Yard. Pick up Scott's Outdoor Cleaner this weekend. Are you looking for a place to buy your landscape and gardening items? Come visit us at Site One Landscape Supply. We offer a large and quality selection of irrigation, landscape, and outdoor living products such as Toro's water-efficient precision nozzles. Site One Landscape Supply has over 30 locations right here in Southern California, and we are the largest national wholesale distributor of landscape supplies in the United States. Site One's knowledgeable and friendly staff is equipped to help you with all your landscape, irrigation, and outdoor living projects. Whether you're redoing your backyard into a drought-tolerant garden or creating a water-efficient landscape for your client, Site One has everything you need including the latest in water-saving technologies, drought-tolerant plants for your yard, irrigation supplies, fertilizer and weed control products, landscape accessories, hardscape products, outdoor lighting, and much, much more. Visit Site1.com to find a store near you or stop by today. Site One, we are stronger together. Well, welcome back to the second half of the Water Zone, everybody, on KCEA 1050 AM, and hope everybody's having a great afternoon. We have a, some great guests coming on the show. Uh, still waiting for one of them to call in. Hasn't done that yet, but we do have somebody special all the way from Flagstaff, Arizona, and it's Ms. Coral Evans, who is the distinguished mayor of that city. Ms. Evans, Mayor Evans, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be oh, I lost you there for a sec. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Great. We got you now. Appreciate that. Um, we were hoping to have uh, Steve Creech come on from the uh, Wyland Foundation. I talked to him about an hour ago and made sure he's all on board and he said yeah and we still haven't got him in but we got we got an exciting person in you and uh, we can go through a bunch of things so you and your city are the winner of a population category for the Wyland National Mayor's Challenge uh, for 2017 and I was there at the event and uh, it was very exciting and to get to meet you and, and your staff and, and, and everybody and it was very 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 exciting and uh, uh, we were very happy to be there. So how did you learn about the Wyland Foundation? Well, um, the Wyland Foundation had been, I guess, in contact with previous mayors of the city um, about this particular contest. Um, I was actually online doing some research regarding water conservation because uh, our council has set the goal that we want to be a leader in water conservation um, nationally. We are a leader here in the state uh, in water conservation, but we set a pretty high bar. So I was just trying to do some research on what we could do, and I ran across uh, this particular competition, and I sent an email to the city manager, and I said, I want Flagstaff to enter this, and I want us to win it. Oh. Well, Steve, Steve just joined us. Steve, how are you today? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Good. Can you tell our audience uh, a little about what, what your organization does? And how, you got, and how you got involved with, uh, with uh, Flagstaff? Absolutely. You know, the Wyland Foundation started over 20 years ago and it was primarily focused on ocean conservation through the efforts of Wyland, the internationally renowned marine life artist. But the more we looked at coastal issues, the more we were looking at the problems that were occurring upstream. So the foundation evolved to start addressing issues related to 
clean water and what we can all do to conserve the resource for our future generations. So now our mission is really about bringing people together for clean water and healthy oceans. And we, we do that through a number of ways, Rob, as you know. Uh, we do it through a, a traveling clean water mobile learning center that's essentially a gigantic science museum on wheels. It travels all around the country. It's got a movie theater on board that teaches kids about, uh, about watersheds and watershed health. It's got a running river inside so we can all learn about how we use water as a shared resource for everything from agriculture to tourism, manufacturing. The kids can even make it rain inside. So it's, it's pretty fantastic, and we've had over a million kids go through that. But as you know, our signature program is the Wyland National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation, and um, it's been a great privilege to get mayors like Mayor Evans involved, and they've done just such an incredible job over at Flagstaff. And the, the program is really about communication. We, we see that that's our role in the water sphere, is providing a platform for everybody to communicate all the different aspects of what it takes to sustain this resource. Excellent. And what, what does the winning cities get, and anybody who does this pledge? Oh, we've got over $50,000 in prizes that are split among the lucky residents in the winning cities. For instance, uh, our grand prize drawing, which we recently had in Flagstaff, is a, grand, is a Toyota Prius Prime. We've got greening your home cleaning kits from Ecos. They're the makers of uh, uh, earth-friendly products, and those are home uh, cleaning products. We also have home irrigation equipment from the Toro Company. Thank you very much, Toro. Um, uh, Low-flow shower heads, home improvement gift cards, the idea is really um, to reward people for good behavior, but also provide information that they can use at home and throughout the course of the year to practice uh, water efficiency and sustainability. Excellent. I wanted to get you in so we can preface this whole discussion. So, uh, Mayor Evans, I know that starting in 1988, uh, the city of Flagstaff started doing water conservation programs. Why did that happen back in 1988? Um, well, at that particular time, uh, the residents here in the city had uh, lived through several dra- um, droughts and times where demands were not met. It wasn't a water supply issue necessarily, but an infrastructure issue. And the number of wells that we had at that particular time and the amount that we could store. Um, the development of water is really expensive here in our region because Um, The top of our groundwater table is approximately 1,500 feet below ground. Um, And so, uh, you know, we have to drill for water. And sometimes, uh, you know, in drilling for water, you have to go down uh, up to 2,500 feet. Ah, okay. And so when you took over as mayor, what were some of the things that you put in place and what was your and the council's vision for, for moving forward and taking it to the, the new the new future? Well, uh, we have a really good council, and even though this is called the Mayor's Water uh, Pledge, I can tell you here in the city of Flagstaff, this was a council, a council goal, a council initiative. Um, when we got together uh, with this new council in uh, January, we said we want to be known nationally as a leader in water conservation in both residential and commercial sectors. Uh, here in the state, we can serve water very well, and we're known um, as a leader here in our state. But we really feel uh, living in the high desert. For the viewers, or excuse me, the listeners who are listening, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, is approximately two to two, two and a half hours uh, north of Phoenix. Uh, we live in the middle of the largest uh, ponderosa pine forest in the world. Uh, we consider ourselves to be up on a high plateau. And uh, water is just extremely uh, precious valuable resource and we're like you know we need to just draw a line in the sand and say we are going to be the best at this Um, and so that's the goal we set out and this particular on competition was perfect because we were like hey let's just go let's just open this this idea this concept that we have and let's just go full on full throttle and the council passed the resolution and the entire council was in on this and um, I'm really excited you know, we, our community is very water conscious to begin with, so it was really a great experience for us. 
Well, I've noticed the excitement when I was there with Steve with the presentations and everything else. Everybody was very excited about about winning, um, and uh, it, it's it's a good thing. It's a great honor to do that. I, I know as your city and the mayor of the city, I mean, you've done a lot. It's, it's collectively. I mean, you've done education. Uh, you put in a, a, a water strategy levels. I think there's a three tier level for that, if I'm correct. Um, how did how did those help, and how did the people accept those things? And then maybe you could also talk. I'm sorry, one more one more thing here. Uh, the, from 1988 till today, uh, the water use per capita. How much have you seen, or the city seen, a difference in in reduction from that? Uh, well, I can, I'll start with the last question, and then I guess we'll. Um Go backwards in the question. Yes. <laughs> so we 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 developed a full fledged two water conservation two water conservation program in 2003, um, and this was after a drought wiped out our surface water, and our water um, conservation codes were enforced for the first time since they were established in 1989. Uh, we had to cut back on water that year, and uh, there was a lot of work that we had to do. So, for example, here in the city of Flagstaff, nobody waters anything on Mondays. That is Water Awareness Day. And then you move forward with um, odd addresses, watering on certain days, even on other days. We have a robust toilet um, rebate program. Uh, and here in our city, the Flagstaff residents drop their water use community-wide. This means both residential and non-residential water users by almost 50% in 27 years. So that's a change from 186 gallons per person per day. Um, in 1989 to 1990, um, in 1989, to 99 gallons um, per person a day in 2016, and we're trying to get that even lower. Wow. I think it's important to point out that this is all the water that's used in the community. So this is like restaurants, hotels, and universities, as well as residents um, divided by the population. Wow. Um, one of the things we're focusing on now, this particular council, is uh, we have a tiered water structure. And really, the residents didn't have a problem with the tiered water structure. Uh, we are now in the process of trying to encourage um, the non-residential sector to use water more, effect, uh, more effectively. Um, and so uh, we're, in, we're working on another rate study um, and how to encourage that. I can tell you that it's been pretty challenging uh, because often those particular customers, uh, you know, they, they talk about, especially when it comes to business, about how much more it's going to increase the cost of business, or they threaten to take their business somewhere else so it can get pretty political. Uh, and so we're trying to work out how we can use a carrot and stick approach to um, make sure that our businesses in our community are being just as water conscious because business needs water actually to grow and thrive, right? Right. And so we're just trying to make sure um, that we can uh, get that uh, for our business customers. Something else we're also working on is the issue of what to charge our reclaim water customers uh, for the water that we formerly couldn't give away. So in the 90s, we decided that all uh, recreation should use reclaim water. So that's parks, that's golf courses, that's everything. Um, now, and at first we couldn't give the water away. <laughs> now it's, it's completely sought after because it's at a lower, it's at a lower tier. Right. And so we're also looking at the fact, though, that we are going to maybe have to drink our reclaimed water um, in a, you know, at some point in the future. So we're looking at it like this water is super valuable, and even though we're using it for recreation purposes, is that really the best thing we should be doing? And are we charging the right amount of money for that? Right. I was going to so say. So that's the discussion. No, I was going to say. I think over time that that water is going to be more is just as valuable as regular water. Yep. And so that's the discussion that the community is having now. Another thing um, that's the goal of our council is to have a sustainable water um, budget. You know, there's definitely many different water resource options um, that we're looking at for the future, all of which have also different energy demands. Uh, and so whatever we consider when it comes to sustainable water future, uh, we're trying to also consider the energy sustainability for that particular water source as well. So that's what we're up to in Flagstaff, Arizona. Wow. Steve, uh, go back to you for a second. So now that you finished the two se 2017 water challenge, how do you still stay in touch? I mean, you, you've, you've had 
thousands, tens of thousands of people participate in this thing, and we have five city winners across the country. How do you now stay, and, and what, what does the Wyland Foundation do going forward with these winning cities? I mean, do they just say, hey, thanks a lot for participating and move away, or there's or there going to be some collaboration between the two going forward? How, how does that work? Well, I think a, a big uh, a big part of the value of this program is it does reinforce you know, the good work that cities like Flagstaff are doing or Athens, Georgia, Aurora, Colorado, the cities that won, but, but also the cities that, that really push their residents. And, you know, hopefully that uh, that gives them some momentum to carry on their efforts. I noticed that in the city of Aurora that, uh, or in uh, the state of Colorado, that the, gover- that the governor just recently called out Aurora for its, um, for its water conservation efforts. And, uh, and he did mention the National Mayor's Challenge as, as part of that. So we, we're very proud of that. But I kind of wanted to go back to what the mayor was saying um, about the value of water, about water that they formerly couldn't give away in the past. We see what we're doing as educating people that this is a valuable commodity and reinforcing that year after year. We think that there's a lot of value in that. So, um when, uh, when when things do change and water rates inevitably go up, people understand that that uh, that this is an essential uh, essential commodity. It's uh, there is a price to uh, having access to it, and uh, and in addition to that, also the mayor was was mentioning, you know, uh, getting people more informed about the the, the energy cost of of acquiring that water. Those are also concepts that we share in the Mayor's Challenge program. Mm -hmm. So over time, we introduce these concepts and hopefully uh, make people more informed and raise their IQ about uh, sustainability, efficiency. Right. So how does how does the, something like the Wyland Foundation, and this can be for both of you to answer, and one obviously one at a time, but how does the Wyland Foundation and the Mayor's Office jointly work together to get the word out and whoever wants to take that first well in, in our case it's it's putting out the challenge it's it's linking up cities um, to essentially be kind of brothers in arms in a friendly competitive way so um, you know get to know other strategies uh, that other cities are using and hopefully they can share that good information mayor I agree with that because I think what it allowed us to do is have a catalyst to kick off this this idea, right? This goal that the Flagstaff City Council set. It's like, okay, we're setting this goal. Now how are we going to move this goal forward? So um, all the work that was put into um, going out and doing outreach, I mean, we did. Uh, I did a video about being a third-generation uh, Flagstonian about living in a house that my grandfather built in 1942, mm. and about the importance of water then and the importance of water now, and into the future for future generations. The vice mayor um, did a video about water and the house that she has that's 100% sustainable. Um, going out into the school and talking um, you know, with the different classrooms about why water is important, it really allowed us, this particular um, contest, allowed us to take the vision of what we had, this goal that we had, and go out in the community and share it in a way that, um, like was said, it's friendly competition. Oh, hey, we can be on the map. This is why water is important. And we haven't stopped. And I think that that's uh, another thing that's really great about this is that we got the ball rolling. Um, you know, we, we got the push out there. And we're still continuing. So we actually have um, events coming up monthly that talk about water and water awareness and why it's important. Um in gearing up for next year, telling people, okay, we not only won this particular um, contest, but now we actually actually have to save the water we said that we were going to save. We have to conserve that. So this is how you do it. And so um, it's helped us really start a momentum, gain the momentum, and it's helped us um, to keep the momentum going. Well, now in, in April, I believe, in Arizona, don't they consider that Water Awareness Month? Yeah, so it's also perfect um, um, kickoff for uh, the contest as well, because all of Arizona um, is participating in Water Awareness Month in April. Great, great. 
Um, I understand there is something called the Arizona Pure Water Brew Challenge. <laughs> and, I, yes. I, is, is, and that has something to do with, I, I would believe, beer. Can I take a stab at that? <laughs> yes, it does have something to do with beer. I feel I would be remiss if I didn't just um, point out to all the listeners that uh, here in Flagstaff, Arizona, we have seven outstanding breweries, outstanding breweries, uh, at the elevation of 7,000 feet. Mm-hmm. And here in Arizona, there is a brew, uh, a brew challenge afoot where... Um, there is a group that uh, submitted for a particular grant, not a flagstaff century group, but they were definitely here about a month ago uh, with this amazing uh, traveling, uh, I guess, display machine. I'm not really sure what to call it, filtration system, mm-hmm. where um, they are um, turning uh, water, uh, reusing water, and using that water to make beer. Mm. Uh, and it's a way to uh, gain more acceptability, I guess, is a way to say it, of Drinking, you know, reclaimed water, drinking water that has been, um, that is now being reused, right? Right. Um, to get people like, interested and like, hey, you know, what does this taste like? So we're pretty excited. Um, they were here in five staff showcasing that. And we're looking forward to them coming back with the final product uh, and having a beer tasting. Well, I know in California, there's a, a couple uh, in Irvine and Los Angeles, they're doing the same thing. Well, not, I don't know what they're using it for for beer, but uh, they they recycle water uh, to uh, to use as drinking water. They they some of the people use the term, and I, my, Michael always tells me it's not the right way to say it, but that's what the politicians call it. They call it toilet to tap, and uh, but they recycle the water well enough, and and the people from the water agencies stand there and drink the water, and and if you didn't tell anybody. I mean, I live in Orange County, and, and I'm told we're drinking recycled water, and I couldn't tell the difference. You know, if somebody told me that, you know, it's all, I guess it's psychological, just like going around the world and eating strange foods to us is normal to, to other people. Um, <clears throat> so Technically, when you look at it, all the water that we drink is, is recycled. recycled. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's only so much water here on this planet, right. and everyone has been using it for a great many years. Yep. So technically, when you look at it from that standpoint... Um, all the waters they cycle. So, so what are more goals that you have? Uh, you know, I know you want to keep moving forward, and you have you have rebate programs. I I would assume for for outdoor conservation. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we what, have rebate programs. Sorry. And what what type are they? Uh, well, right now we have our um, our toilet replacement um, uh, rebate program. We also had a grant where we were going into individuals. We weren't going to their homes. We were invite, having them invite us into their homes to show them how to um, really conserve not only on the water um, sector but everything, you know, how to winterize your house, how to make your house as um, energy efficient as possible. Um, so that included, you know, little things for your uh, faucets to um, help them not drip, tightening up certain things. Um, we have a rainwater harvesting um, ordinance. We have a stormwater ordinance. Really right now what we're looking at is how to implement a tiered water structure for commercial that takes into account uh, the needs for businesses to to, um, be profitable. Um, And again, with a carrot and stick approach, how we could implement some type of rebate program perhaps for like a large hotel, those types of things. Because we feel if we could do that, we would be really successful. Steve, how do you see yourself working forward with cities like uh, Flagstaff and Aurora and, uh, and Dallas and all these winning cities? Uh, how do you how do you help them move the needle? I mean, they, I know they take it and grab it like 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 Mayor Evans. I know she is super passionate about it and does a. Her and her staff are just superb. We all know we saw that. It's, it's just you, you can see the emotion in them when we were there. And and but how do we how do we keep that going? And, and then also tell us what what happened with Wyland and the United Nations. Sure. Well, you know, I, th- I think there are a number of strategies for keeping this going. I you know, I don't want to give away any of the mayor's trade secrets, but uh, I have to say, you know, I've seen some of their case studies for how they perform in this challenge and. It was really a testament to the city's creativity and the hard work of uh, not just the leadership, like the mayor was saying, but also the staff. And I think in it with a um, with something that can be potentially as abstract as water, I think, for instance, they do an amazing job of of making it something that's understandable, uh, where people can understand the issues around it, and 
and, and give them uh, easily implementable ways to observe. You know, we want to make sure that that we're providing um, uh, ways that that people can achieve their their water conservation goals simply and easily. Um, but again, I think it goes back to sharing that information. You know, we also do surveys at the end of every challenge, and we have about 2,000 people uh, take these surveys. And we find that a lot of people are incentivized by the, the carrots that the mayor was mentioning. Um, but we also have gained some insights. We've learned that, that m m many people uh, really depend on their municipality to get the straight scoop on, you know, on, on where the city stands on resource management probably more so than any other uh, than any other in any other way we also find too that once people are are introduced to this information uh, that they do become more conservation minded over time so we've done our surveys year after year and we've consistently seen those results mm -hmm. so uh, you know our goal is just to keep uh, you know keep growing the program uh, getting more communities involved bringing the best ideas forward and also, uh, we do have a, a new program that we're, we're launching with the United Nations Environmental Program, and that's an extension of the National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation. It's called the World Water Pledge. So after you take your water pledge here in the United States and you learn about some of the domestic issues, we encourage people to look at what's going on around the world um, in terms of water quality and also understand what we do here, our local actions, can have global impact. So there will be more to, to learn about that, but that's something we're doing with, uh, with the United Nations and their regional offices. And yeah. we see all of this as a continuum, Rob. It starts right here at home right. what, and continues all the way up nationally. And ultimately, we only have one planet here, right? So uh, uh, we, we, try to people, we try to get people to be more conscious of of their place in the world. You know, it's amazing when you take a look at the uh, per capita of water that people use a day in the various states, and that you look internationally. I know you guys are now going to go off and do this with the UN, where some places use two gallons of water a day or one yeah. gallon of water a day. And, you know, we, we think we can't get along with 55 or 100 gallons a day, and these people are down to one or two gallons a day, if lucky. And that's uh, you know we, we don't see we don't see that we're not experiencing it, so that's a hard thing to to uh, to imagine when you see some of these really third world countries uh, who people can't use any water it's it's really impure and and uh, you know people people get sick and die because they don't have water and water is the most the, you know the most precious resource we have. Sure, and and you know in the United States we we've been pretty insulated from those types of but uh, uh, we can have a role in improving them, um, and that's what the Wyland Foundation is trying to share with people. Great. Mayor, Mayor when, when you implemented all these plans and, and uh, educate the people, is, is it that simple for people to understand, or is, does it take a little bit of time, and, and, and do people want to see proof of all of this that things do work and, 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 and understand why we're doing that? Was it, was it a real challenge? And, and I, I know in, the, in the, the, I guess is what it's called, the strategy levels, your water conservation st uh, strategy levels, there's uh, points in there where people can get fined. And I know we have real heavy fines in California, but a lot of the water agencies really didn't fine people. They just gave them a warning notice in education. You know, out here in Beverly Hills, I'll give you an example. I went to one place with Beverly Hills Water. One house had seven swimming pools, seven. <laughs> and, and the person who owned the house didn't care what the water bill was. He just paid the bill. But how, how, how does that work you know, I, I know you, you talk about the carrot and the stick and so forth, but are you more gentle in the beginning with people so they understand it and not say, hey, you did this wrong and now we're going to charge you the $25 or the $50 or the $100? How, do, how does that work there? Um, well, I think that uh, definitely we have uh, occasionally have that individual that is like, I don't really care how what the bill is. I'm going to go ahead and, and pay it. I would say that I've been on council for um, 10 years. 
And uh, there's only been one case like that that I can remember. Um, and it was, a, it was an individual who just wanted to fill up something, uh, fill up a mini lake in the middle of, like, you know, water restriction season. Mm. And it's when you sit down, you just really have to have a conversation with them. But in general, you know, Flagstaff is a water-conscious city. You know, we went through uh, water restrictions and things like that in the, in the 80s. And so, um, you know, Flagstaff has been really mindful of water since then, if not before then, right? And, um, you know, we do have our water, our, our tiered water rates uh, set up so the more water you use, the more water you pay. Um, and um, I just think that that really works for our city. But definitely you have that one or two people that um, just have a different understanding of what it means to be socially responsible um, and that the fact that we're all in this together. Right. Uh, you, um, you definitely have those individuals. But in general, in general, it's really easy, at least in my mind, when I was out there, you know, I'm pounding the pavement talking about this challenge and why we should do it. Um, there wasn't any um, negativity, and there wasn't any pushback. I think that we really have, and maybe this is not just Flagstaff, but in general, um, you know, worldwide, a more consciousness of the importance of water. Where's our water come from? Are we going to have water for the next generation? How much does it cost to get this water? I just think we have an enlightened society when it comes to that in general. Yeah. I got to give again give credit to you and and like I said I, I just watching your emotion and your passion and your staff and and the whole city it was it was awesome and and same thing with the Wyland Foundation. So I really appreciate you guys being on the show today and, and informing our listeners that water is important all over the country and even in Flagstaff and and uh, and we want to keep sharing these kind of Can stories. Can I make one last comment? Yes, absolutely. Well, I want to say definitely thank you to the Wyland Foundation. Uh, for allowing us to participate in this and for being a part of this. And I want to say thank you to the staff of the City of Flagstaff for doing an amazing job um, with this. Again, even though it's the Mayor's Water Challenge, I will tell you that we would not have won that without um, the staff that we have at the city and the entire support of council. Yeah. Great. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, best of luck to you guys and, and uh, in your endeavors. And I know we're going to keep coming back to you and finding out what's happening in the future. And uh, thanks for listening and joining in. And uh, we're going to take a little break and be back on the Water Zone. Thank you. Bye. Do you hear it? Springtime! And folks across the country are excited to get their yards ready so they can get outside and kick back again. And with Scott's and miracle Grow in your shed, it's easy. Whether you plan to grow spectacular plants and bountiful flowers, or enjoy a thick, healthy lawn all season long, now's the time to get outside and fill... Oh, wait. Do you hear that? The sound of great things to come. It's time to fill your shed with Scott's and miracle Grow. Hey, welcome back, and uh, we appreciate having the mayor of Flagstaff, Ms. Coral Evans, on. And she's just a super person, and as well as Steve Creech from the Wyland Foundation. Uh, we do have uh, some information coming from the Scotts Company, uh, uh, Mr. Dwyer, who's been on our show before, about what do you do with watering your lawn? So we're going to let you hear what they tell you to do, and they're pretty good experts at that. Obviously, your lawn needs water, but what's the best way to do it? Hi, I'm Phil DeWire. I'm a lawns researcher here at the Scotts Company, and we're going to talk about water. Let's think about different ways we can water our lawn, and what are some special tips and techniques that we can follow. The first question is, when is the best time to water? People water in the daytime or the nighttime? Is there a difference? Well, actually, there really is. In the morning, that's my favorite time to water, and here's why. Because I'm setting up my plant for success throughout the day. When we water in the morning, we're giving the roots the water they need, to make it through the hot, stressful parts of the day. Whereas in the nighttime, sometimes we'll keep the grass wet for too long. In certain areas of the country, you can see disease and other problems associated with that. The next question is, how often should I be watering my lawn? And in some places, if you have drought restrictions, you might only be able to water it, say, once a week. But other times, if I have a choice, I want to break that watering up into a couple times a week. And here's why. If I water all at once, Sometimes I'm watering even past where my root zone is. But if I break it up, I'm giving the plants the water they need more frequently, and they don't have the feast and famine that you get by only watering one time per week. So when you have the chance to, I like to break up that watering. So as we look at watering needs across the country, we have from the deserts to the swamps to the mountains, it's really going to change based on 
how much water you get from rain, and also your soil conditions too. So a sandy soil like down in Florida, those are going to drain faster and you're going to have to replenish that water more often. If you're up here in Ohio and you have more clay in your soil, harder soils, they're going to hold the water a little bit better. And so you've got to understand what is my soil type and over time you learn how your lawn responds to your watering as well. There's some special considerations depending on what the season brings. So in a really hot drought year, it's okay if your lawn goes dormant, just like in the winter months when it turns brown. In the summer, it can go brown as well. But if you have, say, a month or so without any water, you're going to want to do what we call a syringe cycle. So it's a really light watering, 10, 15 minutes, just to get the plants moist so that they'll survive a long drought period. Grass responds a little differently than we do during the summer months. When it's a pleasant day, dry, windy, and we're having a great time, not sweating too much, that's actually when the grass needs the most water. But when it's a hot, humid day, the grass doesn't need as much water then. Whenever we're putting down grass seed, that's when it needs the most water. So once you start watering, that's an irreversible process. You've got to keep watering that seed until you see it start to sprout, and then you can back off. So the first week to two weeks, I like to water once in the morning, once in the afternoon, or once when I get home from work. Twice a day is usually enough to keep those seedlings alive, and that's a special circumstance. In summary, lawns are pretty hardy. They can withstand a lot of stress in the summer times, and I like to rely on Mother Nature and rain first. But when I do water, there's a couple special tips. Morning is a better time than night. I like to break up my water and say three, four times per week rather than all at once. And feeding your lawn in the spring, summer, fall is what drives deep roots that are more water efficient. Well, I want to wish everybody a, a great weekend coming up, and uh, hope you listen to uh, Mr. Dwyer. He's a Ph.D. guy, smart, and remember the most important thing to do every single week, think blue. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye-bye. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM, and now 102.3 FM.